I've always been very moved by the movements of the mouth and the shape of the mouth and the teeth. And I like the, you may say, the glitter and colour that comes from the mouth. And I've always hoped, in a sense, to be able to paint the mouth like Monet painted uh, uh, a sunset. But I've never succeeded in doing it. But I was also very influenced by the Eisenstein film, the Potemkin, uh, and the Odessa set sequence, in which is this wonderful shot of the nurse screaming. And also, when I was first went to Paris, I found in an old bookshop um, a book on diseases of the mouth, which was beautifully <coughs> coloured, hand-coloured, the plates were hand-coloured, and that it had a <coughs> tremendous effect on me. And I don't know <coughs> if this obsession, when I was much younger, with the mouth has, <coughs> has sex a lot of sexual implications, as people say it may have, and I believe the psychologically it is supposed to. But anyhow, whatever it was, I was at that time very obsessed by that image. So you might well have been interested in painting open mouths and teeth, even if you hadn't been painting the screen. I think I might. Nevertheless, yes. you did become involved with painting the human screen. I did, and I've always hoped, I've always wanted and never succeeded in also painting the smile. But I, 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 I have never been able to do it. Actually, in your work as a whole, there are relatively few paintings that have uh, ostensible subjects which might be called horrific. And uh, most of them are fairly straight subjects of a figure seated in rooms and so on. And yet people have a sense that your work as a whole is horrific. Um, why do you think this might be? Well, I don't think so. I mean, you may say the carcasses of meat. It's true that when you go into a butcher shop, you see the beauty of the meat how beautiful meat can be, but if you, when you think about it also, you can think of the whole horror of life, of one thing living off another, and the, the natural pattern of life, and the, the natural sequence of life. I mean, it's why when <clears throat> all these, these stupid things about bullfighting, um, because what's, if you go, people will eat meat and then complain about bullfighting. The thing is so mad, they will go in and complain about bullfighting covered with furs, and birds in their hair, in their hair. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so illogical. But yet people's sense of your work as being horrific um, is not really justified by the uh, ostensible subject matter. Why do you think they have this feeling that it is? Well, the thing is I've always hoped to put over things as directly and rawly as I possibly can, and perhaps if a thing comes across directly, they feel that that, that is horrific. Yes, this could because be. if you say, if you say something, <clears throat> even if you say something very directly to somebody about something, they were they are sometimes offended, although it is a fact. Mm -hmm. Because people tend to be offended by facts, or what used to be called truth. Let us say that you have a model, somebody, you've, somebody you have already painted many times from memory. Yes. Have you ever had such a person sitting for you? Yes. And what has happened? They inhibit me. They inhibit me because um, one of the things is I would, uh, if I like them, I don't want to do to practice the injury that I do to them in my work before them, if I like them. I would, rather, I would rather practice the injury in private, by which I think I can record the fact of them more clearly. In what sense do you conceive it as an injury? Well, because people nearly always believe that the distortions of them are an injury to them, no matter how much they feel for, or how much they like you, they do nevertheless, as most of them are not people who are concerned with art, feel the distortions are forms of injury. Don't you think their instinct is probably right? Possibly. Do you not think that when you talk about recording different levels, among other things you may be doing, is precisely expressing at one and the same time a love of the person being painted and a hostility towards them and that 
the marks you were making are both a caress and a blow, an assault. I think that this thing is how, uh, I, I think it, it, it goes to a deeper, deeper thing than this. I think is how do I feel, and this can only be feeling, how can I make this image more immediately real to myself? That's all. Could and you not be making it more immediately real by summing up at one and the same time contradictory feelings towards what you're painting? That would be making it very real, I would have thought. Well, I think that then you would be going into psychological ways of, uh, you know, to, of seeing. I, and I don't think but most painters do. I think most painters are actually, at any rate today, are attempting to bring over the image that they want to record as strongly and as immediately as possible onto the nervous system. And it is not actually as, as involved, although it may be subconsciously involved with what you say, but I don't think it's consciously yeah, involved I at think all. If it was consciously involved, the result would be disastrous. But don't you think, and this is why I say that your sitter instinctively sees this, uh, sees this as an injury, which in a sense might be thought naive, but I'm suggesting but the sitter's instinct is right. It may be in right. In realising what's really going on. What you're really saying is that while, uh, what Wilde said, you kill the thing you love. In the paintings of men in rooms, there's somehow people feel there's a sense of claustrophobia and unease there. Are you aware of this yourself? Well, I'm not aware of it, but the thing is that most of those pictures were done of somebody who was always in a state of unease. And whether that ha has been conveyed through these pictures, I don't know. But I suppose in attempting to trap the, <clears throat> the, this image that, um, and as this man was very neurotic and very um, almost uh, hysterical, that that may possibly have come across in the in the paintings. It's interesting that people want to read meanings into your pictures as if they were problem pictures or um, narrative pictures of some sort. But one wants to read and people like to get a meaning from everything. Um, but they want to get a sort of story, don't they? Or to see the pictures as a kind of comment. They do. On yes. society. They do. Is it ever intended to be that? No. Um, when you do paintings, say, of s nudes in rooms, yes, male nudes, yes, sprawling across sofas or anything, yes, do you have in mind someone else, or do you sometimes think of them as yourself? No, I think of them uh, uh, not not as not as of myself. I think of them. <clears throat> some of those things have come uh, from photographs that I have, and some of them have come from the My Bridge book of the human body and movement, which I have very often used figures from. But I don't think of them as myself. But it's true to say that, of course, that uh, when you paint anything, you are the same, uh, you, you are also painting not only the subject, but you are painting yourself as well as the, as, uh, as, as the object that you are trying to record. Because it's, painting is a double, <clears throat> is a dual performance. Because, for instance, if you look at a Rembrandt painting, you know, I feel I know very much more about Rembrandt than I do about the sitter. So, there's, so in the first place, so you use existing photographs that you've come across, yes. like those in my bridge. Yes. And then you use photographs like this, which you've had taken, in order to paint from, yes. instead of getting a model to come and pose. I have, mm -hmm. yes. In fact, even from friends who will come and pose, I've had their photographs taken for portraits because I very much prefer working from the photographs from, from the from photographs them. than from them. But then you've also used photographs of works of art. 
Well, I have, and I think most unsuccessfully, because I think it's already so remarkable that there's absolutely really nothing to do about it, but I, ha I used it out of obsession. I don't think that any of these things that I have done from other paintings actually have ever worked. In spite of the terrific importance that you give to, to, you know, to, the, to, to the paint itself in an artist like Velasquez and Rembrandt, you paint again and again from photographs. I mean, when you were in Rome, um, you went to see the Velasquez, the Innocent. No, I didn't. You never went? No. And how long were you there? I was, I was in Rome for about two months. And, and you never actually went to see this painting which you'd been working I didn't. after for years? No. It's true to say that at that time I, I, was, um, I was extremely unhappy emotionally and um, I loathed churches, but I spent most of my time in St. Peter's, just wandering around. But um, I think another thing was it was probably a fear of seeing the reality of the Velasquez after my tampering with it. <laughs> I think, it was, uh, I think it was probably a feeling of uh, seeing this marvellous painting, at least or, or what I'd always thought was a marvellous painting in photographs, and then seeing the stupid things that one had done with it. You've also got a lot of things around here of, of your own, I mean, reproductions of your own work. Do you look at them while you're working? Well, I do very, very often. I very often think that I will be able to, for instance, I've been trying in this particular one to make this this image which I did in 1952, and I'm, I've been trying to turn, to make this into a mirror, so that this image is crouched before a mirror of itself. I have to, it hasn't come off, but uh, I very often find I can work from photographs of my own things that have been done years before, and they become very suggestive. Do you make any use of um, preliminary studies or sketches of any sort? Yes, I do. I, I nearly always make a make a sketch. Drawn or, or I, uh, or I I generally just make it out of um, with thin paint, and um, I especially in portraits I make a, a kind of outline of the position in which I want to try. Uh, I think I want to make the image, but um, after that, uh, chance and um, well chance and what I call accident takes over and if anything ever does work in my case it works from that moment when my when consciously I don't know what I'm doing when you say chance you mean something more than improvisation you mean as if you're really working without making conscious decisions they're certainly not conscious decisions. But what are you thinking about? I mean, how do you suspend um, the operation of, of rational decisions? I'm thinking of nothing but how... Does, how, how uh, at that moment, I'm thinking of nothing but how hopeless and impossible this thing is to achieve. And by making these marks about which I don't know how they will behave, suddenly they're there comes something which your instinct seizes on as being for a moment the thing by which it could begin to develop. How much does it help to have had a certain amount of drink when you're painting? Well, this is a difficult thing to say. I haven't done many things when I have had a lot to drink, but I have one or two, and I did the, <clears throat> the crucifixion in 1963. Which was one of the best things. And that was done when I was on the drink on drink for about a fortnight, and um, perhaps it was, sometimes it, it loosens you, and I think it works better, but it's, again, I don't, uh, I, I think it also dulls other areas. You really don't want to lose a certain clarity. You don't want to leave too much to chance, do you? I want, I want a very ordered image, but I want it to have come about by chance. It's a matter of reconciling opposites, I suppose, of making the thing be contradictory things at once. Well, it isn't this that one wants a thing to be as factual as possible and at the same time as, as deeply suggestive 
<clears throat> or deeply unlocking of areas of sensation other than the simple illustration of the object that you set out to do. Isn't that what all art is about? If you think of the great Rembrandt self-portrait in Aix-en-Provence, for instance, and if you analyse it, you will see that there are hardly any sockets to the eyes. That is, that it is almost completely anti-illustrational. And when the, the, the brutal, so-called brutal painting of, of a Jackson Pollock or something like that, I forget what that painting is called, what is the technical term for it? Well, abstract expressionism. Abstract, ab uh, abstract expressionism. That, of course, all that had been done by Rembrandt in a painting like the self-portrait in Aix-en-Provence, but it had been done with the added thing that it was, a, it was an attempt to record a fact, which was Rembrandt's own appearance. And um, to me, therefore, must be much more exciting and much more profound. Inevitably, he's trying to do something much more difficult. You're very preoccupied with chance in painting. You're also preoccupied in chance with gambling. The thing is that um, I do remember once when I, I lived once for a long time in Monte Carlo and I became very obsessed by, by the casino and uh, I spent whole days there and I used to be, think that I heard the croupiers calling out the numbers at roulette, the winning number, before the ball had fallen into the socket. And I used to go from table to table, and um, I, won I remember one afternoon I went in there and I was paying, playing on three different tables, and I heard these echoes, and I was playing rather small stakes, but at the end of that afternoon, uh, chance had been very much on my side, and I ended up with about 1,600 pounds, the equivalent in francs, which was a lot of money for me then. Well, I, <clears throat> I Im immediately took a villa and uh, I stocked it with drink and all the food that I could buy in. But uh, this chance didn't last very long because in about 10 days' time, I could hardly buy my fare out of the... Uh, um, back to London from, from Monte Carlo. But it was, it was a marvellous 10 days and I had an enormous number of friends. <laughs> uh, you don't think you're working an obsession with uh, Christianity out of your system? Well, I don't think so, because my um, common sense would not allow me to accept Christianity. It might not allow you to accept it, but you're sure you've got rid of it? Well, that one can never know, because one knows how very potent some of the images of Christianity have been, and how they must have played very deeply on one's sensibility. So one could never say that one's completely got away. And after all, without believing <coughs> in... One believes in the ethics of Christianity, or a great number of them, without actually believing in the, in the practice of the Church. When you do a crucifixion, I mean, you've done triptychs based on figures. Yes. And you've done these fairly complicated crucifixion images. What is the difference in the attitude of working when, you're, when, you, when you start on a crucifixion? Well, you're wor uh, of course, you're working then about your own feelings and sensations, really. It's, uh, you might say it's almost like nearer to uh, a, a self-portrait, that uh, you are working on all sorts of, of very private feelings about behaviour and about the way life is. And the crucifixion is the armature for expressing it? It is, yes. You often involve the painting of sides of meat in your paintings of the crucifixion. The subject of meat is, so, is such a marvellous subject matter. And of course, naturally, meat has enormous overtones to it. I've used, uh, I've, I've used photographs, and uh, if you go into some of these great stores where you just go through these great halls of death, you can see meat and fish and 
birds and everything else all lying dead there. There have been the extraordinary photographs which have been done of animals just been taken up before they were slaughtered. And I think these pictures were very much based on that kind of thing, which to me is very, very near this whole thing of the crucifixion. I know for religious people, for Christians, the crucifixion has a totally different significance. But as a non-believer, it has just an act of man's behavior, way of behavior to another. As man realizes that he is an accident and his futility, that he's a completely really futile being, that he has to play out the game without reason. I think that even when Velasquez was painting, even when Rembrandt was painting, in a peculiar way, they were still, whatever their attitude to life was, they were still slightly conditioned by certain types of religious possibilities, which man now, you could say, has been completely cancelled out for him. Now, of course, man can only attempt to make something very, very positive by trying to beguile himself for a time, by the way he behaves, by prolonging possibly his life, by buying a kind of immortality through the doctors. You see, painting has now become, or all art has now become, completely a game by which man distracts himself. What is fascinating, actually, is that it's going to become much more difficult for the artist because he must really deepen the game to be any good at all and return the onlooker to life more violently.